Well, it's great to welcome you all back again. Did you have a nice lunch? Huh? And, uh, you know, you can never, and I wouldn't want to ever try and recapture a moment because I believe God's always leading us further. And I feel this afternoon, God's just going to lead us further again. So why don't we all stand and let's just come and enjoy just his sweet fragrance in worship this afternoon. And then let's offer to him you know, our worship, our fragrant offering of worship this afternoon. And, you know, I mean, I always invite people down because sometimes people don't come unless you invite them. But if you want to come down here to the front and worship down here with dance, we would love you to do that. But let's just lift up our hands. Let's surrender again to him and just ask that the Lord Jesus, Savior of the world, but who is our own personal Savior, just to walk into this room right now, Lord. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. We just acknowledge you as the King who we've come to worship and adore. Come on, we open our hearts to you right now. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would so come and fill us right now. Lord, let us be overwhelmed with your presence as we enjoy our worship of you today. So just begin to release your worship right now. Just begin to speak in that unknown tongue. Let's just let a song, a spiritual song, Rama Sanduru Basa Ramanandele Masele De Barandura Masabandele Masne We were made to ascend the heights and worship. We were made to ascend the heights and worship. We were made to ascend the heights and worship. So we will worship you. Let's just sing it out and do something this afternoon. We were made ascend the heights and worship. We were made to ascend the heights and worship. So we will worship you. Sing, we will worship. We will worship you. Yeah. We will worship you. We will worship you. We will worship you.
into your hands. Sing who he is, God my deliverer. God my deliverer, I can trust in you. my Savior, just ascribe praise to him this afternoon. Oh, God, my Savior, and God, my Savior. Sing out that simple refrain. Only you, Jesus. Jesus. Only you. Only you, Jesus. Jesus. Only you. You're the one.
Yeah, put your hand on your hearts right now. You know, that's the dwelling place of the Lord Jesus. He says he dwells with those who are of a broken and contrite spirit. Father, as we place our hands upon our hearts today, Lord, we're so grateful for all the times when you've touched our lives, when you've restored us, when you've lifted us up, when we never thought we could ever be lifted up again. Have you ever known that? 
when you put your spirit into us afresh and we've come alive again. Lord, you just want to thank you that it's all because of one person whose name is Jesus, who is our Savior. He saved us yesterday, he'll save us today, and he'll save us in all of our tomorrows. Father, we just come to give you thanks that we have met this one who's called Jesus, your son. And Lord Jesus, we want you to know that your name is like honey. Your name is like ointment that's been poured forth. And because of that, we love you, Lord Jesus. Because of that, we will run after you. And so would you come and touch our lives afresh today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, just applaud the Lord, can you? Oh. You know, there is a wonderful thick presence. You'll find it when you come up here. It's just a real thick presence of, of God um, amongst us this afternoon. And isn't it wonderful every time you position yourselves to come into his presence, he seems to add another dimension of who he is and how you can experience him. And, and I'm looking forward to this afternoon. Um, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Rick, who's going to really be opening up the whole sense of the apostolic from the life of Nehemiah to us this afternoon. But I want to mention a couple of um, resources um, and that is, um, again, the supernatural ways of royalty. Did you know that you are a son of the king? Yes. Huh? Well, you didn't seem that certain. Let me tell you. You are sons and daughters of the king. And uh, you know, there is a way as royalty you live your life. Did you know that? Listen, Prince Charles doesn't live the same type of life as I live. In the natural. That's what I'm talking about. Why? Because he's royalty. You know, nobody opens the door for me or... <laughs> I know. Uh, as my dad would say, well, you're big enough and soft enough to open it yourself. You know? But you see, his life is lived differently. Why? Because he knows who he is. And this book will help you to live your life differently because you know who you are. Isn't that great? And Chris Balaton and the Supernatural Ways of Royalty, Discovering Your Rights and Privileges of Being a Son or a Daughter of God. Did you know there are certain rights that you have and there's certain privileges that you have, and uh, you'll learn all about that. It's a great read. It really is. And then also, I know um, Elaine mentioned it last night, but I want to mention it again because it really helped me um, two years ago when I read um, this book, Apostolic Centers, and uh, I came home and I brought a few copies with me, and I said to Ryan, Ryan, you need to read this. And um, no, I said, Ryan, you don't need to read it. You've got to read it. And, uh, and then I said, no, Ryan, you don't. You haven't got to. I'm commanding you to read it, <laughs> you know. Um, and, uh, but it really is a wonderful, not just a wonderful read, though it is, but it's a very practical step-by-step -step so that you can measure. You know, there's a whole thing with journey, a journey is a measurable distance. And uh, this book enables you to measure the distance that you travel in terms of coming into the revelation of an apostolic center. It's great to be able to do that. 
then you can go back after and you can reread it, look at the passages that you mark down and then mark a few more. It's just one of those books. And I recommend it to you, Shifting the Church so that we transform the world. Isn't that great? And so there's his book. And then also, in um, Sharon usually brings these resources up. Um, but I did a study um, some um, years ago now, um, which we put into a manual, and we used to hold a Tuesday night um, equipping here, um, probably about six years ago. Um, and we looked at the house of heroes. Um, it says in Nehemiah that David had a house of heroes. And, um, and, and I put in there um, one person's um, uh, quotation of what a hero is. And he says, a hero is telling people you don't like apple tart when there's only one piece of tart left so that you get to eat it. And uh, you see, sometimes it's in the small things that we become heroes, not in the big. And most of you can think of all the people who have touched your life. And some of them are, haven't been big heroes. Some of them have been very small people. And yet they turned up for you at just the right time. And, um, and so the house of Israel, it's looking at who are the heroes. And then also, it's about taking your prophetic words and seeing them become a reality. So that you take hold of them and you work with them, you war with them, until you see what God has prophesied over your life become visible. When it's visible, you are actually entering into it. And so there's a, a manual there that will help you do that step by step. So those are some resources for you. And then also, don't forget, if you're wanting a copy of the sessions here, um, fill in this form, hand it in at the um, book um, shop desk out in the um, reception and we'll get all of those um, recorded or duplicated up for you. Okay, it just means it's easier if we do it as we're going through rather than waiting till the very end, okay? So those are some things there. And um, now I want to introduce Rick. Um, great message this morning. And I felt he gave us a panorama and um, painted a picture for us that um, I don't know about you, but I hadn't seen some of the ways that Rick had portrayed the apostolic church. Um, and so for me, it was very revelatory. And I want you to welcome him as he comes to minister this afternoon. Rick. Afternoon, everyone. So one of, one of the things we're going to be buying for the house is a slightly bigger clock than that my wristwatch that's up there. Um, so apologies if you, if you miss your lunch or what have you earlier. You know, often you'll find preachers take their watch off, don't they? And they put it on the pulpit. And a little boy said to his dad, Dad, what does that mean? And dad said, absolutely nothing, son. <laughs> Hopefully this afternoon will be more succinct for you. Just to summarize the, what I was trying to get across to you, a little bit of sharing, personal testimony, dreams, visions, what God did it for me in that, and the whole thing about, you know, we want apostolic authority, but we want the version that doesn't blow up the church. Yeah. We want the version that builds up, doesn't blow up. We want the version that's, that's for the long term, that Jesus recognizes when he comes for his bride, he recognizes those apostles as his apostles. He recognizes the apostolic church as his apostolic church because the DNA and definition are out of his heart. We're, we're an extension of him. Paul said, I only lay a foundation upon Jesus Christ using costly things. I use uh, precious jewels and this and that and the other, and he describes them. And he says, you can build with other things as well. You can build with straw and hay and stubble, but at the coming of the Lord, those things in the judgment, in the trial by fire, will be burnt up and of no purpose and of no remembrance even. 
And when we build for our reputation, when we build for our empire, when we build for our enjoyment or for, for our aggrandizement, those are the straw, hay and stubble building materials that come the day of the Lord will be completely removed and everything we built for will be forgotten. And so we choose to build upon that foundation and I describe the foundation as love upon which and from which we, we have a humble heart. You see, because of love of, that Jesus had for the Father, he humbled himself. Lo hum humility is not ever in a vacuum. Humility comes from somewhere. It comes out of a motivation of love. And so we humble and empty ourselves because he is worthy. And he should receive the honor, the glory, and the fame. And so we get low. And as we get low, the Holy Spirit says, oh, there it is. There's the character of Christ. I'm going to remain there because that's for his glory and his fame. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he brings his anointing that can create the universe to bear. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us. Why? Because we humble ourselves and we get low and we obey the word of the Lord. And we just, we just come into that revelation. So that, for me, is the biggest... You know, my biggest prophetic word to you is align yourselves with that heart that was in Christ when he walked the earth. If you do that, you are creating the space and the environment that will transform everything around you and can transform cities and nations. So that was, you know, kind of the point of that this morning. This afternoon, what I want to do is just for a, a, a while, a while, look at... <laughs> gaze upon um, one of the stories of the Bible which um, is told over a hundred years and uh, Old Testament scholars will tell you that um, the story of Nehemiah and Ezra and um, Haggai and Zechariah and those guys is one of the few places in the Old Testament where we can put a pin on the map and actually date the Old Testament we can date it there and uh, we were saying over lunch you know <laughs> we'll come back to this one um, that you can actually go to Jerusalem and date or find that period in history. Because when you look at the walls and the buildings of Jerusalem and you look at around the archaeology of the city, you can see that in, in, the, in the walls is a really rough part. It looked really rough. And that was the time when they built and rebuilt Jerusalem. And so many of us know the story of um, of Nehemiah. Could I have my PowerPoint just at this point? If I have a PowerPoint, do I have one? Maybe not. It's a. Uh, it's all about vision. So I spent a year uh, teaching on Nehemiah, book by book, little by little, and uh, yeah, there's a great part in Nehemiah three. You don't often get sermons on Nehemiah three because it's lists of people. But I'm fascinated by who's in the lists, aren't you? I'm fascinated by who's in church and why they're there. And, um, and in this story, what we see is the work begins in the rebuilding. And just to fill in some of the background, the work had started 50 years or so earlier uh, under a different king. And materials had been given, building work had started. But those builders got discouraged and they stopped building. And around the time of Haggai, Haggai says, hey guys, what's going on? You're building your own houses, but the house of the Lord remains unbuilt. And uh, remarkably, uh, and I think that's where we get do not despise the day of small beginnings. I think it's also where we get that, you know, people looked, don't, don't look at the former things, look at the new thing that I'm doing. And there's, there's loads in that story for us in Haggai. And what was happening, I think, was the people were intimidated by the task. It was too much for them. So they thought, we'll take the easy route, we'll look after ourselves. Each man to his own house. Because the work of restoration just seemed too much for them. And it was also multiplied by the opposition that was coming against them. That Nehemiah also gets when he starts to take up that work. When Sambalat and Tobias come and say, even a fox could knock down what you're building. It's pathetic. It's useless. It's, I mean, look at it. Look at what you've done. And, you know, the enemy comes to us today with the same words. 
You know, what, what is this thing you're trying to accomplish? Really? Those people? Really? That? You know, five people showed up. Did not despise the day of small beginnings. And so in the story of Haggai, he says, go up into the mountains, get some wood, come down and build. Now bear in mind, this is the aftermath of Solomon's temple. Oh, Solomon's temple. Come on, join me. Oh, it's a great big temple. It's impressive. There's gold everywhere. There's more brass, bronze than you can actually measure or count. It was so impressive and yet it got raised to the ground. And the builders who built were taken off into slavery. So there were no skilled people. The, the people left to do the work were the unskilled, the elderly, the, the weak, the young, all of those people that when the conquering armies came and said, ah, oh, no, we'll leave you. It doesn't matter. You can stay here. <clears throat> um, well, you can come and you can come and you can come. Oh, you've got a degree in stonemasonry. Okay, you can come. You're an engineer. yet yeah, we'll have you. Um, yeah, you make amazing uh, pies will take you with us and, and so on and so forth so, so what happened is that the, the world system absolutely excavated and asset stripped out of God's people everybody of skill does that sound familiar does that sound anything like today in some senses you know that, that, that what's happening is there's a great draw upon the church to be pu pulling people into the world because we aren't creating space for them. And so there were very few people. And, and the amazing thing that Haggai says, and you may miss it, he says, go up to the hills, bring some wood down and start to build. And I will fill what you build with glory. Gosh, that's encouraging. So it's not the size of the building. It's not how pretty the stonework is. It's whether we will be obedient and start to build. If we will start to build, then God says, I'll put my glory in that. I will put my glory in your feeble attempts to create a place and a space for worship. If you remember what happened in the story of Elijah, Elijah takes, as was prescribed, 12 uncut stones and makes an altar. Not fancy stones, not a ball temple, not smoke and mirrors, not laser machines, not LED lights. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Sharon got it. <laughs> Twelve uncut stones and the fire of God fell on it. Why? Because it was a sacrifice. It was the evening sacrifice in the right way at the right time. God said, Amen. Poof. And there is something about apostolic authority coming out of a humble heart that will obey the Lord and do what he's asked us to do when he's asked us to do it. I think we sang about that earlier. So here we are mid-story and we pick up the story of Nehemiah hearing about the ruin of Israel, or the ruin of Jerusalem, and everything's in distress, and he's in distress because of it, and so he gets on his horse, and he, 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 he puts his life in his hands, and he goes to see the king, he says, king, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be sad in your presence, which was a death sentence, he survives that risk, and is given release to do the work of the Lord, so here we have a pagan king blessing the work of the Lord. Again, probably topical for um, governments <laughs> at the moment. A pagan king funding the work of the Lord and releasing it with a blessing. Picking up the story, um, Nehemiah chapter 2, he says, Then when I, I said, you see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ru ruins. The gates have been burned with fire. Come, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. And so what we see in, in this is here comes, um, here comes an apostolic builder who's also a prophet, who knew the hour in which he lived and knew how God wanted to see that temple restored. He took, it into his, took his life in his hands, took his work in his hands, his professional life in his hands, and he says, I'm going to do it. I'll be the guy. And God is looking for people in this life who will do something for God. Turn to the person next to you and say, do something for God. You know, wouldn't it be great to get to heaven having done something for God? Okay, and, and I was telling our students last week, pinned on the wall in heaven, 
in, in your encounters with him. Pinned on the wall are a load of job descriptions. And he's just waiting for you to apply for one of those jobs. To pull it off the wall and say, that's mine, I'm going to do that one. And there was a story, wasn't there, when David said, who will take Jerusalem for me? Whoever takes it will become the leader of my armies. Job description. And somebody applied for the job. And he got the job because he did something for David. And, and, and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is asking the same question of us at this time. Who will do something for me? Who will take a city? Who will take a street? Who will, do, who will open a prayer group? Who will worship me faithfully? Pull those job descriptions off the wall. And that's exactly what Nehemiah did. And he went and he told them his testimony. And he had a prophetic vision for them of what God wanted to do. And you know, when is a prophecy not a prophecy? Anyone know that one? It's not difficult. When is a prophecy not a prophecy? When you don't say it to anyone. Start there. You know, you have a vision, a dream, a picture, a, a stirring in your heart. And you think, oh. And before it even gets to your lips, you have self-cancelled it and put it into the pending file or even worse, into the rubbish bin. You know, it becomes a prophecy when somebody speaks it. When the sound of that word comes out of a mouth. And that's what happens with Nehemiah. Not only does he get a vision for what God wants to do in his time and through him, but he actually begins to articulate his vision. He does it with wisdom because in the first instance what he does is he walks around the walls for a little while saying, Lord, have I got this right? Is this really what you want to do? Is this, how much of this do you want to do? So by the time he speaks to them, he has developed the vision into a plan. And, you know, there are degrees of prophecy, let's put it that way, ranging from, <laughs> I have nothing, sorry, <laughs> shop closed, through to, hey, I've got a picture, I've got a word, I don't understand what it means, to, I've got a picture, I've got a word that I think means this, through to the other end of, to some degree, Old Testament, sorry, thus says the Lord, but I believe God is saying this and he's going to release this on the earth. And at that end, you've gone beyond, you know, simple prophetic pictures and symbolism to the point where you are so prayed up, so full of faith, you know that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on you. Okay, that's a decree. He has anointed me to, to preach good news to the poor. And you've got to, from, you know, potential faith, maybe God will do it, to expectant faith, he's absolutely... Put in place what he's going to do. And usually when you get to that point as well, along the way you've had testimonies. There is the door that opened. There is the man of peace. There is the divine provision. There is the, the, um, the, the collaborating vision or picture that came from someone else. Here's a fun thing to do. If you go to a prophetic gathering, sit in the room and say, Lord, what are the prophets going to speak? That's what I like to do. Get a, get a prophetic word about what the prophetic word is going to be. And um, it's surprising as you, you know, just keep going with that one. Not just for pride, but it's just encouraging. And, and hone your skills um, in, in the prophetic. So they, he has a prophetic vision that becomes an utterance. And of course, he also has prophetic action. And that's great as well, isn't it? The testimony, testimony about Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When you actually stand up and say his name, the prophecy comes into action. When you actually begin to step out and do something in that name, the, the utterance becomes an activity. It, the word becomes flesh. And prophetic action is required sometimes. And very often what we tend to do, and I used to know a guy who did just this. He owned a Ferrari back in the day when it was a a 348, so that's a long time ago. A Ferrari 348 is an old Ferrari now. And he never took this Ferrari out. He had it in his garage. He had his garage tiled, painted, and then carpeted. <laughs> I'm just going to leave my Ferrari in the garage. You can imagine how I felt as a, as a young guy. Man, I wanted to take that thing out and wring its neck. It's like God saved the queen on the back wheels. You know, woo. 
but he would just have this thing in the garage to look at. Maybe he'd start it every so often. Then, of course, you know, he'd clean the soot out of the exhaust, keep it lovely. You know, prophecy is not meant to be put on a wall and adored. It's meant to cut. The word becomes flesh. The word happens. The word becomes something. And prophecy is meant to strengthen, encourage, and build up. In other words, when we utter our prophetic words and our decrees, it should actually meet something in the heart of the people that says, you know, that's just what I was thinking. Yes, let's do it. Let's go for it. And when you have that convergence, and I used to see this out at sea on the lifeboat, every so often you'd get a wave coming in and a wave going out, and they would meet in the middle, and both waves would rise up. And what happens in our prophetic sometimes is that our utterances meet the heart of the people who have a longing that resonates with the prophetic word. Oh God, how long will you forget us forever? And the word comes in and says, no, I will not. Get moving. And so the people in this part of the story begin to build. And the prophetic utterance becomes a prophetic action. And this will be assigned to you, Isaiah 37. For you, Hezekiah, this year you will eat what grows by itself. The second, what springs from that. The third year, sow and reap. Plant vineyards, eat fruit. Once more, a remnant of the kingdom of Judah will take root below and bear fruit above. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant. And the Mount Zion a band of survivors, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That's what Isaiah said to Hezekiah, to get him moving. And it met the longings of his heart. And if we're going to align with the word of God, we have to make ourselves available to hear it in the first place. And then we have to make ourselves prepared to pay the cost of what we're being called to, to be involved in. And so what Nehemiah did was he called people to the building work. And they all replied, you know, the waves hit in the middle. Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Okay, great. Yay, we're off. We're going to do it. And the, the very next verse, the very, very next verse says this. When Sambala, the, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, official of Geshem, the Arab, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this stupidity? What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And so, you know, the, the war of attrition begins. And I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. <clears throat> we, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you'll have no share in it in Jerusalem or any claim to, or historic right to it. And then in chapter 3, which is where it begins, you get a whole list of people who get involved in the buildings. And so what then we see is that not only do they have prophetic utterance, they have prophetic action that looks like they come together and partner with one another. So one of the things I mentioned this morning was you don't have the church or a church or an, prophet, an apostolic center. We need them all over the earth. All over the earth, all over the UK. I have people come to church from 50 miles away. They pass, and how many churches have they passed to come to my church? How many churches did you pass to come here? Because there is something here that you need to partake of. That, a well that you need to drink from. And there are people that we need to find and connect to apostolically that we can partner together. Of course, I'm the leader of Partners in Harvest, I'm going to use that word. But we have to partner together. And there was an impartation that happened in that encounter between Nehemiah, who was acting as an apostolic person, as a, a prophetic person, and he's saying, let's build again, let's lay a foundation again, let's reestablish worship. And they were on a hundred-year vision. And he found the people and they worked together. And what was in his heart became what was in their heart. It actually matters that we meet together. That's how impartation happens. That we lay hands on one another, we pray together, we listen together, we worship together, we share together. Like on the road of Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us? Because they met Jesus and received an impartation 
of hope and life that the Savior was risen. Did not our hearts burn within us? Impartation. <clears throat> Vision was given to them. And with that came a heavenly commission. Come, let us build. And we have a heavenly commission. There is not enough yet on the face of this earth glory being given to God. There just isn't. There isn't enough glory covering the earth. It doesn't cover the earth yet. So there is a mandate and a commission, a co-mission in that mission to cover the earth with the knowledge and the glory of God. So that's why we plant churches. That's why we raise up centers like this one that will, that will feed not just themselves but a region and hopefully connecting together with the others a nation. You know, and I drive past, I've told them this before, they'll have forgotten, but whenever I'm up and down the M6 and I hit Birmingham, I always pray for these guys because they're, they're regionally effective. And I'm praying, and I had a picture for them once. You know the guns of Navarone, some of you. That there are big guns in this house. And the whole point of the gun, guns of Navar Navarone was that the guns were so powerful and had such range that they could dominate cannons, they could dominate a whole area, a whole terrain. And you know, God wants to establish apostolic hubs that can, that can produce life, that bring down the culture of heaven, that keep that culture on the earth and do something to distribute that culture. And yesterday, Alan <clears throat> shared a word about, you know, we have to receive the seed and become the seed in order we can distribute the seed. And you may despise the day of small beginnings. You may think, yeah, that's great for you guys. It's great to talk about apostolic churches, but I'm not that. I'm just me. Hey, you're on a scale. You're on a scale that actually brought you here. You were attracted by the Spirit of God to come into this room because somehow you're on, a, you're on the, the Ephesians 4 list. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And that needs to be established and encouraged and grown in every one of us. When the Ephesians 4 list says they are there to equip the saints to minister, what does that actually mean? It means raise up more apostles, raise up more evangelists, raise up more prophets, raise up more pastors and teachers to, to go out and equip more saints. Teams of teams. And so they began to partner together in their heavenly commission. And, you know, genius is in these verses when we look at it and when we see who's in there. But they also decided to do something. One of the genius things that he did was he parceled out the work. He didn't just say, okay, everyone, let's go and build something. Okay, you build there, 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 you build there. And then when it really kicked off and got dangerous, he grouped them in families. In other words, they were bound together by love and by the sense of a shared vision and shared investment in each other. <clears throat> you know, a lion walks in the room and starts to walk towards, you know, snack-sized children. You may think, oh gosh, you know, fine, I'm gonna, I, I think I could just jump up and get through that air conditioning unit up there. But if it's your children, you're looking for the heaviest object or the sharpest object you can find. You will fight for that which you care about. And so God, in his wisdom, called us together into families, into tribes, into peoples and groups called churches and congregations. You know, I care what happens to my fellow believers. I care what happens to the people in my church because they're my responsibility. We're working on this together. And if the trumpet sounds, I'm not only going to build, but I'm going to fight for them. I'm going to contend for them. There was genius in what he did here. And you could read the whole of Nehemiah as a book of um, project management, leadership skills, and what have you. But really, Nehemiah is a type for Jesus. He came to reestablish something and restore Jerusalem in order that true worship may take place. When Jesus comes, he says, the Father is looking for true worshippers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And he was about to establish the new Jerusalem and rebuild those walls that had been torn down by sin and evil. And so 
he gives each one of them, Nehemiah, a trowel. And he parceled out the work. And each one of those people owned the vision for their part of the wall. And it's interesting as well, this is an apostolic statement for you. If you read carefully, some of the wall was repaired. You'll see the word repaired. And some of it was rebuilt. And so there are parts of the wall. And this, this is the bit that, that's going to help you if you feel excluded. Okay, You may not have the strength or the wherewithal to start again and rebuild a whole wall. You may have a level in the anointing to do a repair. Well, I'll repair that small section there. I'll do that bit. But I'm going to align with the people who do have the wherewithal to build bigger things. And one of the weaknesses of a non-apostolic culture is that everybody goes back into their little room and lives out of their limitations. But when we have apostolic culture, when we have the prophetic call to do something, then what happens is, and this is what I tell our chur churches in our movement, you are either an apostolic hub or you're going to align to one. Suck it up, get humble, and align. And you know what, I'm going to be really honest now, really, really, really honest, is, you know, I, I know of, I'll, I'll just, I'm trying to, okay, I'm trying to smudge all the details off this one. But I've come across conversations where a person says, hello, I'm Apostle X, Y, or Z, and they've got 15 people. Now, they may have an apostolic impulse. They may have an apostolic heart and be pioneering. But they've been, they started with 30 and now they're 15. Hello, my name is Bishop Reverend Apostle Fred. Okay? And, and we've got like, we've got 15 people. And we therefore want to say we are the hub that everyone comes to. Actually, this guy who's really humble and he's really nice, he has way, way more grace to build. So why don't you go and work with him and learn from him? Wouldn't it be great if we could get that going in the body of Christ? But it requires love and humility that says, okay. And I always remember Ken Gott said something during, actually, Trev, it was during the healing outpouring in 2008. I had him at my church. I don't think you were there. And he said, we've just got to learn to drink from another man's well. And it stuck with me forever and ever. Amen. God bless Ken for saying that. But it's true, isn't it? In the kingdom of God, we've got to learn to drink from each other's wells. I have to come and drink here. I want him to come and pour out in my well and to drink from my well. And when we will do that, you start to see beacons being formed all around a nation that can bring heaven to earth, not just in one little group for a, a period of time, but consistently bring the glory of God to fill the earth. And that's what Nehemiah was about. And so whenever we are about a work for the Lord, remember this. Whatever level you engage with that work, whether it's helping somebody else or whether it's leading your own thing, we are always working to a higher purpose. Some higher purpose that's bigger than me, bigger than my vision. Nehemiah was working to a higher purpose. He was the governor. He was the guy in charge. But he had a higher purpose. And it was even higher than, I'm just going to get these walls rebuilt and the gates on. It was to repopulate Jerusalem in order that temple worship could continue in order that. And I don't think he fully understood the big, big picture about the Messiah coming. But he knew that that temple needed to be functional. And no matter how ugly the walls, he was going to get enough going that that could start to happen. And we have to keep our eyes on the higher purpose. And while we do so, there may be oppositions. There may be testings. There may be seasons that we go through where we are so discouraged. But to my left and to my right are my brothers and sisters who will encourage me in those moments of, of, of being downtrodden. <clears throat> and again, one of my sort of pet peeves is when one church goes through a bad, I'm not, you know, Every church that I know of goes through a bad patch, and sometimes more than one. And, and, and sometimes there are reasons for that, and, and sometimes it's, you know, the, the leadership, leader, leadership have made mistakes. Cut them some slack. 
for goodness sake. And, and they make mistakes. So what happens is, you know, a chunk of the herd say, right, we're going somewhere else now, and they go somewhere else. And I think one of the really dishonoring things that happen is that the guy who receives them keeps quiet. He just goes, oh, yeah, 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 come in here. That's fine. Come sit down here. See that chair there? Feel that one. Feel how cold it is. So if you just sit on that chair, it will be lovely and warm. And, and, you know, and it's just about, you know, bums on chairs. It's about feeling better about yourself because you're looking at a bigger crowd in the room. And there is nothing kingdom about that. When people come to my fellowship, I pick up the phone and say, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? What's going on? So-and-so shown up in my church. Are they crazy? Have I, got, have I gathered your crazies now? And, um, <clears throat> you know, usually there's a story that we can, we can help each other. And sometimes, you know, sh- you'd be shocked to hear this, people leave my church. I mean, why would they, for goodness sake? <laughs> and they go down the road. Well, God, God bless them if they've gone in a good heart. And, and yet, you know, it disappoints me when we, we don't have those inter-church leadership conversations. And that should happen. Sorry, ran over on that one. <laughs> but the work got parceled out. Everybody owned the vision. Everybody did their bit. There were, I mean, just look at some of the people included in this. There were goldsmiths. There were perfume makers. There were, there were priests. <laughs> there were children. You know, Shalom built a section of the wall with the help of his daughters. Big, strong girls. <laughs> Building the wall. That's probably a very neat part of the wall, actually. <laughs> so all of that, the guys built, and then there's this really nice bit <clears throat> that the perfumers made. And, and um, yeah, you know, a few gel nails got broken <laughs> in the production of this wall. But everybody pitched in. We all are called. To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Everybody gets the manifestation of the Spirit. Everybody gets involved in the mission. You know, we need to take the word the out of the statement that says, I am called to the ministry. I'm called to ministry. The ministry is a professional clergy that runs things. Actually, what we need is to, we are all called to minister. Whatever our background and skills, whatever we have, we bring it to the table. And so they own the vision. And there was unity and encouragement. You see, when I'm driving past this place on the M6, probably 10 miles away is the M6, I'm encouraged because you're here. I'm just encouraged by that, that you're still going on. That you're still running with the fire of revival. That is just an encouragement to me. And so we have almost an inductive, silent encouragement for each other, don't we? Do you want to say amen? Amen. And so what they produced was excellent but not perfect. And when we go for perfection, we're going to fail. But when we go for excellence, the standard of excellence is measured in heaven very differently. God measures your heart and says, that's excellent. You have a heart after my heart. David was not perfect, but he had a spirit of excellence in his worship. And so the sword occasionally had to come out and they were prepared for problems. Families fought together. And the last thing to say really just to think about As we think about the apostolic work we've been given of restoration and renewal and revival in the earth. Is that clearly in that list, if you read it for yourself, there's not time to read it today. But just go away and have a look at the list. Think about it. There were some who rebuilt. There were some who repaired. There were men and women and there were children. And they had all kinds of different skills and backgrounds. There were some who were governors and leaders and high priests and priests and, and there were some who were the, the field workers just out in the fields tending the sheep and they all brought what they had together. And you know, one of the great things we need to do in any move of God is find the young people and bring them with us. 
into, so the next generation, there's no gap between one generation and the next, but that they are coming alongside us into revival, into whatever's happening. And I want to challenge you right now. You know, when you think about not just addition of people into the church, but multiplication of graces, which is way better. Who, Lord, can I multiply my life into? Who will come with me as I follow Christ? Who will come with me? And bring young people to these sorts of gatherings. We're under 30s. And, you know, I don't know. I just keep getting this name, so I'm going to say it, Trevor. I really... I really feel there's a James whose 30th birthday will be on a mission. And, in, and, and if there is a James in the house who will be 30 during one of your trips to India, he's got to come with you. I don't know who that is, but I'm just leaving that out there. But he's, he's around that age and he's going to be released into a miraculous ministry. So find a James who's 30 around that time. Pin it on the wall and someone will apply for that job. All right? So, so that's it really. And the story of Nehemiah is an amazing story of how the work we are about became nuts and bolts, bricks and mortar, stubbed toenails, stubbed because you all wore sandals, you know, broken fingernails. And within a very short space of time, they built the wall to halfway. They took more hits and more ridicule. And you will always take the hits while you're doing the work. It will always happen then. And the enemy is saying, just stop. Just stop where you are. Just give it up now. How many half-built walls are there in your life where the emotions spoke louder than the, than the vision? And your limiting factor in seeing breakthrough and revival is your emotions. It's not God. How much will you hold on to him? How far will you go with him? And I can think of the times where I got discouraged and I slowed down or I put my tools down and said, I'm done here. I've had enough of this. And my emotions spoke louder than the, than the prophetic vision and the, and, the, and the call and the commission. And it's time to come back to our callings and our commissions and to hear what God wants to finish in your life because he wants each one of us to do things for him, to be brave and to get things done. And so, you know, there's a practical element to all of this, just as there was with Jesus. And he took very rudimentary and unlovely stones and he looked at them in his hands and he says, with these rocks, I will build my church. With these stones, I can take a nation. I can change the world. And he wants to do that with us. So I'm going to invite the musicians to come back, if there are any. Oh, look at that. My timer is saying stop. I am a learning computer. Shall we stand together? Thank you, Holy Spirit. If you know your Bible, you will know how many astounding miracles there were that actually looked very ordinary. It was just an axe head, but it floated. It was just a baby born in a stable in the middle of the night in a place that nobody cared about. But he was the savior of the world. It was just a bad attempt at copying Solomon's temple and it was made out of wood, not stone, not gold, trees from the hills. But the glory came to rest in that place. It's just you, little old you, through which God wants to do a great work. 
So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to renounce. Just take a moment to pray with me now. We're going to renounce and cut off all the ungodly beliefs that limited what God could do through us. And we're going to take hold of that promise that Paul utters. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We're going to align ourselves with the people who share that vision that Christ is the hope of glory. That in us, he's doing amazing works. And through us, he will shape history. Father, we so many times have said no to people because we limited ourselves. We've said no to the call. We've said no to the commission. Because like Gideon, we despised ourselves and would not listen to the utterance that came from heaven. Hail, mighty man of God. Hail, mighty woman of God. And for some of us, we, we turned aside at that point, afraid and shocked, but somehow as we drove away, we looked in our mirror and you were still stood there. Today's the day, Lord, we're coming home. We're going to turn around and we're coming back. We're going to pick up our sword and our trowel and we're going to fill in those gaps in the wall that belong to us, that are our commission. And God willing, there will be people on either side of us doing just the same thing, brick on brick, stone on stone, Lord, where we, and some of us will be here, we've wearied of the fight. We've wearied. We've fainted and our hands and our knees have grown weak. Nehemiah prayed, strengthen us, Lord. Jesus is praying today for your strength. The Holy Spirit is here right now to strengthen you, to encourage you, to build you up in your most holy faith. So Father, would you send your ministering angels into this room right now. And Jesus, we're sorry that we ever put you in the rear view mirror. We're turning around and we're keeping you at the front. Lead as we pray. not despise the day of small beginnings. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So we're just going to come in through that door that is always open into the heavenly realms Jesus said we could come and no one is ever permitted to stop us we are never barred we are always welcome Father I ask you to speak to every person in this room new commissions new commissions with a smile on his face he's going to say hey you left this here last time you left and it's time to take up again our commissions to join together as an apostolic company across the earth to play our part and it's not where we've come from it's where we're going to Father, call every person in this room to their higher purpose, to their life's call. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're just going to wait on him a little bit longer.
about 16 years ago, surprisingly, Jesus called me out of the city of London back to Blackpool. And I left a, an easy, growing work for what I knew would be a very hard and difficult work to reestablish things in open wells that had been closed. And I was talking to him about this because he had told me certain things. And he said something that I've always stood by recently. He said, Rick, do you want a church of a thousand people or do you want a hundred churches of ten? Of course, it's the same thing. Actually, one is better than the other because it's all about multiplication. And God would say to you as well today, don't despise the, the day of small beginnings. Line yourself up with God's higher purpose today. What I want to do is just say, if you want prayer and encouragement for that, we want to pray for you. And um, Trevor, myself and others will just come and lay hands on you for the Father's blessing over your life. And I would just encourage you in these last few moments to just come and receive. If you want to just soak in his presence for a little bit, the, the worship leaders are going to take us just into the river now. The great thing about the river is when we get to the center where he carries us, we rest and he moves. So Father, we just bless you for your word which is living and active in our lives today. Come Holy Spirit, minister your grace to each one of these we're just going to spend maybe 10, 15 minutes. What we do in my church, I don't know if, if Trev's okay with this. I do what's called a soft close. So when people feel released, they can go and they can stay if you want to stay. So then there's no pressure. You don't have to wait. But if you do want to wait on the Lord, as Joshua did at the tent of meeting, then there is a place for you to do that. You can stay, you can soak, you can receive prayer. But we want to just pray impartation on you and blessing. And I want to encourage Trev and the other guys and whoever his team are to come and begin to pray with people now. And if you're in the team and you're up here, that's okay. It's your time to receive.